let me set the stage for folks. Uh, it's a new album from Ivan Neville of the uh, legendary and, and the American royalty, I like to think, of that family. And the album is Touch My Soul. It's his first solo record in almost 20 years. Now, Ivan was on with us, uh, leader of Dumpster Funk. You may remember he was on talking about that during the pandemic. And uh, son of Aaron Neville, nephew to the other Neville brothers, one-time member of the uh, Neville brothers himself. He was in Keith Richards' Expensive Winos band. Bonnie Raitt's band. And this is an all-star album as as we turn to that a little bit. Uh, Bonnie's on it. Trombone Shorty, Aaron and Cyril Neville, Michael McDonald, our recent guest too. So man, it's amazing. You uh, And are you joining us from New Orleans right now? Yeah, I'm in New Orleans. <clears throat> and this has been your, uh, is this a house that's been part of your family's history or just mm, kind of thing? No, this this is a, it's, it's, it's a historic house, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some history here. It's an old New Orleans house with the high ceilings. And I've been living here for probably maybe six years, five okay. years, six years, something like that. Okay. <clears throat> great stuff up yeah. on the walls. New Orleans just has so much great visual uh, feel when you're, when you're there. And uh, great that you're you're there talking to us. Now, it was Touch My Soul, I'm assuming, I've got, but I could be wrong. <clears throat> the album was recorded there, too. Was it uh, recorded? Yes. Yes, it was. Yes. Okay, now we, uh, now that the yeah. pandemic, with that, we had been talking, of course, you went through it in a heavy-duty way, actually having COVID and that and wild story that you shared. But thinking about the recording process, how was that done? Was everybody there together? Give a little explanation to to how you laid it all down. <clears throat> okay, actually, everybody <clears> – sorry about that. Everybody did their uh, – most of their stuff, well, some of the guests. Some of the guests, including Bonnie and my dad, did theirs from their respective homes, huh. studio studio near their home. Got it. Now, Michael McDonald, now that, uh, the, the first song I wrote was Hey All Together, and that was a standalone song, standalone song that was written with no intention of doing a full re a record. Hmm. I just, and that was before the pandemic. That was in 2019, I believe. And Michael McDonald happened to be in New Orleans playing a show while I was developing that song. Oh. And I had already, I, I, had, I had thought about, you know, uh, wanting some, um, some, uh, some great and uh, maybe even very recognizable voices as well. That kind of occurred to me. It'd be cool to have some iconic singers that, you know, that you hear their voice, you say, oh, I can tell, oh, that's, that's, that's them. And Michael McDonald happened to be in New Orleans, and I sent him uh, the track, and he heard it, and he came by, he came by the studio and sang <laughs> some harmonies and some stuff on the choruses and on the bridge, and he was the first one on it. And then I got Bonnie to sing. I sent her the track in California, where she lives, and I sent it to my dad up in, uh, he lives up in uh, New York, Pauling, New York, and uh, and that kind of came together like that. And then Trumbone Shorty, obviously, he, he's in New Orleans, so he did his stuff here. And the rest of it was recorded here in New Orleans. Wow, your dad lives in New York? Is that what I just got? <laughs> yeah, you, you just heard it. You heard it from me. <laughs> the cat's out of the bag. He's up there now. You know, he when my mom passed away in 07, and he had been, he had, you know, he had always lived in New Orleans for the most part, except after Katrina, they had moved to Tennessee for a while. And he, um, they never moved back to their house that they had wow. in New Orleans after Katrina. My mom passed away, like I say, in 07. Right. And um, a couple years, a couple, two, three years later, he got remarried. And his wife, she's in New York, a New York lady. Wow. And so he ended up moving up there. And they were in the city for a while. They were living in the city in like Manhattan, like 21st, 21st, uh, 5th Avenue and 21st Street, somewhere like around there. And then she was um, an avid uh, plant a plant person, you know, growing stuff. Gardening. So they, they, they bought a house and they turned it in. They, they got a farm up there. Nice. They got a little farm situation and that's where he is. Yeah. And so he's pretty much not leaving there. <laughs> Such an incongruous image, huh? <laughs> of him. Yeah, he, he's yeah, he's got a little, he's got his dog up there, and he's he, 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 got, he makes videos of his dog running around in the grass. What kind of dog? And, 
I think it's like a Shih Tzu kind of one of those. Kind, I'm not sure it's a Shih Tzu, but it looks like one of those little dogs like that. It's all about the love, anyway, right? As a, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't matter the kind. Yeah. He's on that All Star uh, opening track. Now that's funny. But you said about the date, getting back to the record and the song, because it seems like. You said when it was written. I mean, the country was sort of had been falling apart on a slow, a slow decline for a while. It right, be. right. So, but it, but when you hear this this tune that Ivan's got this hey all together, and it is the first uh, song on on the on the album, it does seem like a nod to how the U.S. has kind of lost a bit of progress we had been making and getting along. Talk a little bit about the lyrics and and whether that's sort of what you're saying. Yeah, you know. Um... Not only growing up in New Orleans and, you know, Southern hospitality, things of that nature, and growing up here, we're, we're just um, acknowledging your fellow man as you walk down the street. I grew up with that. That was a normal thing. Like, if you pass somebody on the street, you normally said, hey, how you doing? Hey, how are you? And, you know, especially in your coach knit surroundings in your neighborhood but then that went outside of that like if you if i was walking anywhere and i saw somebody walking past me i would maybe a nod acknowledge that they were there and a lot of the uh, places especially recently over the you know last several years uh, we've gotten so de so uh you know divided about a bunch of stuff and people just um been concentrating more on on differences instead of similarities, and I just kind of felt inspired to write a song about you know, you know, just because we you know we we may be different in some ways, we have a lot in common. So you know, it it must be a difficult. <clears throat> I wonder because it's gotten so severe. You wonder about when it comes to your career and all the cats that you have to interact with and. Because music, to do what you do, it's a you're a very collaborative person in general. But for most people's musical career, it is going to be a lot of collaboration between the band members and the people who work with the band, et cetera. Do you ever find that this current divisive time uh, brings stress or tension with any of your professional? Has, has, has it seeped that closely into what you have to do? You know what? I've seen it a little bit. Not, it's not extremely close to me. But I've seen it, you know, around the campfire here and there where someone was, uh, had an opinion about something and it was maybe uh, disagreed upon by someone else. And I've seen uh, static happen about that. Mm. I've seen artists that were um, uh, generally seemingly good people and uh, cool, uh, good, cool musicians that had strong opinions about certain things. And then I saw it kind of trickle over into their their careers, whereas they've been looked at as, oh, you believe in that? So, you know, maybe you're not as cool as we thought. I've seen that happen, which is unfortunate, but, you know, it got pretty polarizing, a lot of this stuff, you know, sure. especially, you know, over the last seven or eight years, maybe even longer than that, but, you know, you just like you said earlier, like I, I, I had been seeing some progress. When growing up, I saw some slight progress. When I was in high school, it seemed like things were getting a little bit better. I thought education in the public school system, when because I went from Catholic school and I went to public schools, and there was a big difference. Sure. And I saw a little bit of progress in this in the public school system, and then that absolutely deteriorated, right, right. and it went totally like you know uh, very downhill, and so I guess that uh, that kind of same uh, notion, that kind of same little direction, went on in a bigger way. A lot of yes, it affected a lot of other things and a lot of other institutions and a lot of other opinions and relationships uh, as well. So yeah, you know that song definitely was inspired by. The lack, the lack thereof, uh, you know, the lack of, you know, what I thought was camaraderie that we re and, and and fellowship, civility. That I, yes, and no, yes, civility, absolutely civility, but just that common courtesy, common courtesy toward your fellow man, which has nothing to do with what religion they are or what color they are or what they believe, but just your fellow man and just being courteous to one another, which I think. I don't think it's too late 
for us to maybe try to acknowledge some aspect of that, you know, because it can't hurt if we would sometimes forget about our differences and remember that, okay, you know what, that's just another human being that's going through something maybe similar uh, to what I'm going through in life. So maybe they could use a hello or a nod or a smile or like what a one of these. Right on. <laughs> But without well, it meaning, know. but without it having some secret meaning, right? Because like now, exactly. Oh yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> now those well, symbols. Right. Are, are no, like, I remember Rodney Dangerfield used to say that. Just give me one of these, and he throw the OK sign up. Right. <laughs> but that's it. That's but I, yeah. Lord knows what it means now. I don't know. Right. Maybe I don't want to do that. Oh, well, maybe just yeah, yeah. It was, it was some, some QAnon. It was some QAnon. No, yeah. See, it was. Huh? Yeah. It's funny how that went to that. That's crazy, man. Yeah, no, I know what you mean though. But you, what you're, but that's what the song is about. Is a time before all that, really, and the time. Yeah, before, yeah. We were, we were divided. You know, it was funny when I was uh, uh, taking a listen, and and this is exactly what I thought the song was uh, essentially about. And it's great. These are the the kinds of things, folks. Um, you know, we need. You know, so in, in so many ways, I'm sure I I assume that your dad looks at this as his son is making a positive uh, contribution to. Uh, to the dialogue of, of the community. I assume that's what your pop would think about that. But uh, Michael McDonald's on that. We were just talking about him. Now, when you were a kid, <laughs> for me, one of my very first Michael McDonald memories, and it always makes me giddy to remember watching, because I was a huge fan of shows like Good Times and What's Happening. <clears throat> when they were on What's Happening, you know. and, and I remember I, that. And I saw it yeah. maybe a, a couple years after, and so it was like a few years later, and I always remember Pat Simmons with his hair like down to his waist. <laughs> and uh, Yeah. And Michael McDonald on that. I was just wondering, was that uh, episode an, an important part of your childhood? I remember that. What, did they sing Taking It to the Streets? Yeah, they sang like, like four tunes or something. Yeah, it was a two-parter. Yeah, that, man, I remember that. Absolutely. But you know what? That's so cool how that crossed, you know? Oh, totally. That, that's what we used to do. Genres and uh, ethnicities and all of that stuff, we just crossed, you know, and... And it, sometimes there was there was no thought about it, and it was like it seemed so natural at times. Right. That's you know? what I meant about when you were talking about the song. That yeah. it made me think of like yeah. you know you talk about a different era, <clears throat> excuse me. And there we are, and it's like a a, a a black American TV show with this white soulful band and like total integration into that in a fun, yeah, innocent kind of way, gentle <laughs> kind of way. You know, a time of like very very innocent time, um, and. Yeah, and, and it's neat that he's on that kind of song. So in a way, you're kind of you're kind of bringing it uh, full circle. Another guest on that record. Now we mentioned Bonnie, who uh, you were talking about how you how you got everybody together. Um, now you were a part of. You go way back with her. I don't want to like short change your story. How does uh tell the story, if you will, of how um, Bonnie Raitt enters your life? Maybe it's even when you were a little boy and your parent and, and your dad was getting yeah. you around the cool place. <laughs> No, well, actually, no. How, how it happened was there was a guy by the name of Hutch Hutchinson. Oh yeah, from Maui. Oh yeah, he plays he, he plays bass. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. He's got a place in Maui. Hutch yeah. has a place in Maui. He does. Yeah. So Hutch, Hutch used to play with the Neville Brothers. That's how it happened. Okay. And back in like '79, when I was joining the Neville, I joined the Neville Brothers around late '78, '79. Hutch had just joined the band as well. So he and I were bandmates with my dad and uncles wow. for some years. He left and he went to California sometime around 1982 or 83. Okay. And he moved to California. He had been, I think Hutch is from Massachusetts originally. Yep, exactly. He had moved. I think we, I first met him in Austin, Texas. Okay. So he got around a lot. Of, he'd been, you know. Uh, any anyway, he he moved to California, and then I I moved to California a few years after him, maybe a couple years after, around 1984. So by the time I got there, I was fooling around, you know, mulling around, trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I had you know hooked up with some folks, and I had done some things musically, but I didn't have a real gig, I didn't have a real job playing music, and um, Hutch had gotten a gig playing with Bonnie Raitt. And at some point, whoever was playing keyboards at the time was leaving the band to do some other things, and they were looking for a, somebody to play keyboards. And I, I ended up getting that gig. Is that and, the first um, time you met her? That was the first time I met Bonnie, yeah. I knew who she was. I knew of her. And I maybe we had crossed paths 
when I was with the Neville brothers, perhaps, but I knew who she, I knew who she was, but I hadn't really, wasn't, you know, had never like spoken to her or anything like that. So there we were. And I got, I was in her band. I played with her for probably three years or so from 84 to maybe 86, 87. You know, when in all that time, she always attracts all kinds of interesting cats and has been around a really, really, really long time. What are some of the, when you think back, that things that make you laugh or, or uh, that you just treasure and make you just feel so good to think of, man, in those three years, I remember when so-and-so sat in, we were in this one. Right. And what yeah. were some of those yeah. ones that you, that well, you we, we I, about? There, there were times like when we, I remember when we, um, we uh, ran across the, the guys in Little Feet. Uh, um, Richie Hayward and those guys, or Paul Barrere, right. we would run across those guys pretty often. And there were times when, like, you know, like somebody like that would sit in. I think there was a band that Paul Barrere had with a guy by the name of Catfish, Ho Catfish Hodge. They had a band called Chicken Legs. Okay. And it was kind of a spin on Dick, it was kind of a spin on Little Feet. Dixie Chicken. And from that. Yeah, it was called Chicken Legs, and they had a band. I remember them, and I remember crossing paths with them on many occasions. But one of the coolest things I remember doing with Bonnie was the entire band. We were off one day. We didn't have to work that night. It was in 1984, and we all went to see Purple Rain together. Oh, wow. The entire, the entire band and Bonnie. We saw Moved. Purple Rain for the, for, at the movie theater for the first time when it just come out, 1984. Wow. And that was pretty, that was something I'll, I'll remember fondly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's a lot of time to spend with an artist doing something totally off stage and. Yeah. Uh, right. And musical. Yeah. That's a great memory. I love that. Well, and, and you know, I always, I mean, w whenever I think about it, getting to listen to her sing, that was one thing that I always dug when I was always on, when I was on stage with her, it at some point or another, it would occur to me that, wow, I'm playing. But I get to hear her sing yeah. like every night. And that was the coolest thing. And these feelings were rekindled a few years ago. She called me up to play with her in, in 20, 2018 and 2019. I did a couple of tours with her. Oh, wow. I think Mike Finnegan had been playing with her. And Mike Finnegan had left the band. And uh, she got me to play. I did a couple of tours. And it was the most amazing time to kind of full circle yeah, yeah, playing exactly. with Bonnie, you know? Yeah. Back doing that again. And uh, so not a lot of fan, not a lot of like Jackson Brown kind of cats just show up. You never had to, because it's <clears throat> interesting when you have to get, we, all of a there, sudden you have to be on the ball and do something. There was, there was some of that. There was some of that. I remember one time in particular when we were going to play uh, uh, one of the uh, benefits that she was a, a champion of. It was the, back in the, no, they were the No Nuke concerts. Oh, wow. They would have the No Nuke shows. And there was one that was Don Henley was a part of one of the shows that we were on. And I believe Jackson Brown was on that show as well. But Don Henley, our band, we ended up backing Don Henley up as well. Oh, wow. So that was, a, that was a blast. We played, and I was a big fan of Don Henley's. So we got to play with him. Now there was some other ant some other uh antics that went on during that little weekend that were I, I won't get into a details, sure. but we were we were misbehaving. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> it was the eighties, you know, maybe nineteen eighty five, eighty six perhaps. There was a lot of there was a know, lot of substances going on that you know, there were some things, there were some enhanced well, some enhancements that were happening. To quote we Don Henley, <laughs> to quote Don Henley, a lot of dirty laundry back then. There was some stuff. Yes, there was some fun <laughs> stuff going on. Yeah, that's a great. So you had to learn his stuff. So Bonnie just says to we you one to, day, "Hey, we're going to have to learn X number of tunes." Is that how you prepare? Like, how does how do you get a if you can recall? Because that's a kind of a professional um challenge if you will it's not like a regular gig like suddenly you have to play like sunset grill or whatever it is five different well episodes. you know actually it, we did, it wasn't that many songs that we okay. had to learn because okay. part of his set he and jd father played a few acoustic songs got it and then we played like maybe two or three songs with him it wasn't a long set but it was it was still a challenge and and, and fun at that 
yeah. when you were with Keith, did, was it also like, because you had these, you have a storied career. Um, and did Keith ever, like, at the night of the show, with no warning, suddenly either change in the set, new song he wants <laughs> to do, and or Mick Jagger or anybody shows up? Well, I'm just going to say that okay, with Keith, okay, it was always fun. It was always fun. It was always musically and every, I mean, fulfilling in many ways. It was so much fun playing on the stage with, with Keith and the guys that were up there in that band. Waddy yeah. Wattel, Steve Jordan, Charlie Drayton, and Bobby Keys would play saxophone with us as well. And along with Miss Sarah Dash from The Bell would sing backups with us. And also at, for, at one time, at one point, a, a gentleman by the name of Bobby Floyd he sang backups as well. But but the point, there was one song that we recorded, and it was a song called Struggle. And there was a B section to this song. And it, it had a groove, and then it goes to this other little thing. And the funny thing was, as long as we played that song, I never knew when that B section was coming. <laughs> I never knew. There was not an amount of bars I could count to prepare me for this next section, I had no idea. And we probably played that song, I don't know how many times. I never knew. I had to watch and listen when that part comes. And then it would come, I would catch it. And the most, probably one of the most fun um, moments was the first, the first gig, the first live show we played, the first live gig was on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> that was our first live gig ever. <laughs> yeah, songs. we played Saturday Night Live. Two songs. Yeah, we played, and we played Take It So Hard and that song Struggle. Wow. We played Struggle. And Struggle, it was, yeah, I, when I think about that, it had a, a little riff. And then it would go. But I never knew when that other section was coming. That's when. So I would just be up there playing and I'm just watching and listening really intently. And then, cause he might go to it, but he, maybe he won't and see, Oh, here he goes. And I'm following right behind. And it was amazing. Wow. <laughs> now he keeps you on your toes that way. And who yes, was any absolutely. of those, any special guests on SNL that you would remember from that? Uh, just uh, Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks was the host. Wow. I remember that Tom Hanks was the host. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's what I mean. You've gotten to do, uh, you know what I was thinking? And we haven't really mentioned him before we let you go. The, uh, and again, it's Ivan Neville talking about touch my soul first solo act record in almost 20 years. And, and if he sounds familiar, he was with us, uh, talking about his dumpster funk record, not that long ago, but, uh, this record has, uh, it features your uncle Cyril on there. We were talking about your pop is also on there dialing into what a unique way to grow up. So you grow up, you're this little kid. And you've got a family, a bunch of brothers um, who are making this band that influential kind of band, changing the face of music in a lot of ways, exporting New Orleans sound, but then mixing it with funk and soul and rock and like this like um, combination of stuff that was the Neville brothers. And so I was hoping you could share some stories, if you can, about think all the way back <clears throat> to when you were a child. And times that they brought you out there, how was it? How were you first exposed to their touring routine? And if you can paint a picture of what life was like and the kinds of interesting lessons and or fun memories that like now, especially like you don't have all of your uncles, you know, art has passed on. So like right, and Charles, when, yeah. when, when you think, Charles, when you think about like those being a little kid and sitting on the side of the stage, maybe sitting on road cases, being on a bus, a plane, eating, just things that are, are great to remember that make you feel good. Well, first, first, first of all, I want to point out how great you described that, that situation. You, you described what the Neville brothers did and it's so, so amazing. I ain't going to lie. You. <laughs> I Thank was you. impressed by that, man. I really am. I appreciate it. Because it's it's a perfect analogy of what they did. Because they are one of the most influential bands out of New Orleans ever. And what's funny is my uncle Art 
he happened to not only start that band, he started another band that was Meters that were amazingly influential Funk. to music as we know it. Funk yeah. music, hip hop, and everything else. So basically, so when, when, when I was a kid and I knew that my dad was going to, to sing or my uncle Art maybe picked him up, and he, my uncle lived. My uncle Art lived like a block away from us. Like, but so he would pick him up in his car, and they would go on to a gig. I, and it, it just the fact that I knew that they were all musicians was just kind of a cool thing. Now they were, they were mostly like kind of, you know, we we they they were blue collar kind of cats because they didn't. My dad didn't have a lot of financial success uh, early on. Right. He had that. He had the song "Tell It Like It Is" was like this big hit, maybe reached to number two, perhaps, on the pop charts and whatnot. And he didn't make any money on that stuff. So we, it didn't change. Our lives were the same for quite a while. And watching them do what they were doing, and he would, he would like you know, have other jobs to supplement his music income right. or lack thereof. Got it. And he would go work on the riverfront and do other all kinds of odd jobs. So I watched him really take care of his family as best he could with the music. And and there was the, it was just musical around us because we had characters. We had like James Booker, this amazing piano player who was right. like an absolute, you. an absolute character. Right. And then we had um uh you know uh, Dr. John, Mac Rebinat. This guy. And I remember the first time I saw Alan Toussaint. Alan Toussaint was the songwriter that had already written a bunch of songs. And he had done well for himself. Because right. he had written stuff for Al Hurt. And maybe he even wrote the theme to the dating game, I, I believe. I <laughs> believe the, the theme song to the dating game, I believe, was written by Alan Toussaint, perhaps. So he was doing, I saw him pull up on, on a motorcycle one time. And he had on like this boss sweater, and he's he had these uh, these boots, the pants tucked in the boots, and he looked sharp. And I was like, I said, Dad, who's who's that guy? You know, this guy's doing well. He's doing better than we're doing. <laughs> and my dad, my dad said, that's Alan Toussaint. And I figured it out who he was, and he had written a, a lot of songs, and he had produced a lot of the music that was going on uh, locally in New Orleans and stuff like that. But I, you know, seeing them kind of you know, uh, doing what they were doing and, and, and seeing my dad, it, it, it's, it's really special uh, later on when I realized that he was grinding it out, man. He was playing shows, playing in clubs, and they weren't, like, making it big yet. You know, they were just doing the grind and playing music and making, um, you know, taking care of their families as best they could. And when the Neville brothers started seeing some uh, uh, like when, when I could, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to when I started playing with them when I was maybe nine, 18, 19 years old. So they would they took me on the road. The first tour I ever went on, the Neville Brothers were fairly new. They had only been a band for maybe a couple years, two, three, two, maybe two years perhaps. And I went out, and there's a celebration in a, in a tradition in New Orleans. It's called a Mardi Gras Indian. And if you come to New Orleans during Mardi Gras time, you're going to see parades, but you're also going to see, if you go to certain areas of the city, you're going to see Mardi Gras Indians. And that's African Americans that dress up as Indians. Like Native and Americans. Yes, yes. And it's and that, that's just a whole history behind that. Right. I won't get into that, but my, my great uncle my great uncle, George Landry, also known as Big Chief Jolly of the Wild Chapatulas, right. he would, they, 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 the, they had a tour, it was called the Mardi Gras Mambo. And it was the Neville Brothers, Dr. John, and the Wild Chapatulas. So the Nevilles would do a set, and then toward the end of the set, I would come out with, a, with an Indian costume, along wow. with my great uncle, wow. along with my great uncle, and my uncle Charles would come back and put a costume on, and we would come back out. And we would have feathers and stuff and looking beautiful. And we would play these songs, the Wild Chapatula songs. And that was my first introduction into touring with them. And I I played a little bit of, of keyboards, maybe on maybe one song. 
Right. And then somewhere on the tour, one night, Dr. John looked at me because he would, I think he played a set beforehand. And one night he said he invited me to play with him. What? He said, Ivan, why don't you come play? Why don't you come play some? Why don't you come play some of that funky clavinet? All right, place, wrong time. And I'd go up and play clavinet, the funky keyboard. Right. That you might be, if you don't know what a clavinet is, it's one. It's, it's an instrument that Stevie Wonder used a yeah. lot. Sly Stone used a lot. Very recognizable. And he, I, I would play that with with Doctor John on one song, and then I would go back and I would come out at some point with the Indian costume. <laughs> with the Nevels. So that was my introduction into the first tour that I had ever done with the brothers. Now, when we went back home, I was determined to up my keyboard playing and whatnot, and then they, they, they let me in the band. And I became a, a member of the group and playing keyboards with them. What a great, like, it's a kind of a variety <laughs> show, though, of experience for you, because it'll really help yeah. shape your kind of uh, how you can perform, because you had to do a little bit of everything. Not to mention, though, the real humble aspect of uh, what a lot of people don't realize, which is the grit it takes to make it. Because for so many artists, they're not superstars and it takes a lot of money. Um, there, there's an illusion that they have a lot of money and it takes a long time before that sort of thing comes, if it ever does. Uh, and then there's no real guarantees. It's not like a job that other people have uh, that has uh, health insurance and stuff that comes with it. Yeah, people, yeah. An employer. It's a. It's a very, very yes. different thing. So the way you described it was uh, was touching. And we've heard uh, over the sh years many other, you know, interesting, because I know you appreciate stuff like the Yardbirds, their drummer, Jim McCarty. So there's this legendary band we all grew up with. But just like your pop, in a different way, after that 60s period was done, Jim still got him pay his bills. Jim ended up driving. Yeah. He drove a taxi for a while. If you can, oh my god, right. the drummer on For Your right. Love and all those jams, right, 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 driving a taxi right. because oh he, yeah. So when you said that, it made me think of Jim, who's a wonderful storyteller and just a uh, like you know, like you, has worked with so many, so many legendary uh, cats. We lost him not that long ago. I was curious if any of these. Uh, did Jeff Beck and you ever cross paths, Jeff? We lost. You know what? I met him. I met him once, and 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 that was pretty much it. I I maybe crossed paths with him a few more times, but I actually met him one time. Okay, just that. Nothing. Uh, nothing. Yeah, nothing yeah. more. And uh, and and when you were before joining the group, is there a time you remember? Because that's an incredible one, though, with the the evolution with the costume. I mean, I'll never forget. It. It's like the coolest of cool stories. But as a little boy. Was there a first tour that they took you out on when you were a child, needing to be attended mm -hmm. like a minor? Mm -hmm. No, no. no I went. I went to a club. I mean, I went to a couple of bars okay. with my dad, and that was kind of cool because I knew I, like, I'm not. I'm too young to be in here. But <laughs> that's Aaron. That's Aaron's kid. Right. So they let me hang out somewhere on the back on the side <laughs> sure. while they played their show. Right. And I remember it being in one specific club. Is there was a little nightclub called the Desert Sands. Wow! And that was in on Claiborne Avenue in New Orleans. And I remember being in that place on several occasions. Maybe my mom had was busy doing something, and I had to go hang out with my dad. And he took. You and along. I was probably I was probably ten, eleven years old, or something like that. And I went to the show with him and hung out. You know. And it was more because you, you had to be, right? Because that's a great picture. It wasn't like he was he was yeah. trying to take you there. It was because he, he, and, he yeah. had to. And then the Dr. John, you would credit him. That's a remarkable story. There you are at a young age. You know, obviously you've done a lot to get to that. Was he really, was that one of the first times a major artist that people listening would know the name of kind of did something really cool for you other than your family? Probably so, yeah. Yeah, I feel, felt. I mean, it made me feel really special that he let me come and play with him. And that's because I was barely. Riff. Yeah, I was barely playing with the brothers. I was like right. just kind of. I was doing the Indian costume thing yeah. and uh, Mardi Gras <laughs> Indian, which at the time I was like, that's it that gets me in the door. That's right. And I really loved the Mardi Gras Indians and the whole idea of it. But I was like, I wanted to be playing in the band. I wanted yeah. to play in in the group. You wanted and to do more. And eventually, I did. No. But the fact that Mac let me play with him, that was like a nod to, okay, fellas, sure. this, little, this little dude's got something. 
and it's and my, you know, <laughs> price. Uh, that's a that's a message to the people around you too, your family and everybody. Like, wow, look at that. Yeah. Just, he's good because they respected yeah. Doctor John for sure. Did he end up staying in yeah. your life throughout his life, or were you guys? Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over the years, yeah, yeah, we crossed paths all the time. Okay, and I played with him on several occasions. Yeah, he's... yeah, and I I had one particular fun hang with him. We we both we were the we played keyboards for a project. It was a it was a film, a documentary concert film, and it was called Lightning in a Bottle. Okay. I think it was produced by Martin Scorsese. Oh wow. Directed by Antoine Fu Fuqua, I believe. And it was the band was like jo Steve Jordan was the M musical director. It was Steve Jordan, Levon Helm was on drummer on drums. Willie Weeks and Larry Taylor played bass guitars. Kev Moe, Danny Korchmeyer played guitars. The horn section was, uh, a, a, I think, a mixture of people, but some of the Memphis horns was there. As a matter of fact, right. the horn player, the trumpet player, I think his name was, his name was last name was Caldwell. He was he was the surviving member on the plane with Otis Redding. <laughs> from that, I forget his, his last name was Caldwell, I believe. A Caulfield or something. Anyway, me and Dr. John were the keyboard players in that band. And oh, we man. backed up everybody from Bonnie Raitt to B.B. King to Mavis Staples uh. to Hubert Sumlin. It was, and it's called Lightning in a Bottle. It's got, and everybody that was still around at that point, I mean, Solomon Burke. Uh, yeah, Natalie Cole. Yeah, every, there were so many people on that show. Lazy Lester and Ruth Brown, Ruth Brown. And me and Mac, I played a lot of um, organ, and Mac played a lot of piano. And we hung out for about three days doing rehearsals and doing this show. And I got to just listen at him talk smack, yeah. like, on a daily basis. And the way he talks, and, like, man, yeah. he'd be telling me little stuff. And, and I'd be over there cracking up, like, laughing. And, you know, it was just a, an amazing time with, with him. No, I can imagine. Uh, side note, when I worked, I li I did radio in Boston for a long time. I used to mix bands for a while, and I um, I was mixing this band. They were called Slide, and they were like a New Orleans kind of funk uh, rock band. And we had a gig opening for Dr. John for two nights at the House of Blues, the original House of Blues in Cambridge, Mass., the tiny little one that was like a 150-seat church that had been I remember that place. Yeah. I remember and that place. So up in that dressing room... You remember everybody had to share that little room. So for, yeah, when you talk about him telling stories by night two, when he was more familiar with us, he was telling us all kinds of stories. To sit, to sit, <laughs> I can you know, imagine. For, for a bunch of guys like us who were not in the position you would you would be in, you know, that was like a, uh, so yeah, when you told that, that's a, uh, I can I can still remember him, like just uh, yeah. story after story. What a, what a character. Yeah. And with that a character. Boy, Total. Or, 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 or character, as he would say. What a correct. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, final question for you, uh, because I don't think uh, we ever talked about it last time. And uh, we did talk about your late mom, though, because I, I know the, the song that I like so much, Yellow Moon, uh, connects uh, to, to your mom. Yeah. But um, your gumbo recipe, for any of our listeners who might find, <laughs> uh, who might find that. Okay. I hear that this is what it is. Onion, bell pepper garlic celery there's three different kinds of sausage then you've got chicken thighs and chicken breasts some lump crab meat and shrimp but then there's a very special pot that you use oh yeah i got this one pot i use but did you forget there's one other element and that's called the roux ah the roux and by 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 the way my mom's maiden name is oh, roux right. joelle roux r-o-u-x Right. So we know I, I learned how to make a roux watching her, and that's just uh, flour and um, oil. And I would I would have a mixture of vegetable oil and bacon grease to make my roux. <laughs> okay. That's my roux. Yes, yes. The secret ingredients. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's mom... the ingredients. You got all the ingredients right. Yeah. I did? Okay. And, and that's, yeah. that's your mom's uh, bay leaf. Bay leaf. Bay leaf as well. Bay leaf. Okay. Uh, three, four babies. Yeah. Well, we were missing a few, but but hopefully she's smiling up there, giving us yeah, yeah. a high five. <laughs> well, yeah. It's a great pleasure as always. Someday, hopefully, we'll get to try your uh, 
your gumbo ourself, brother Ivan. It's Ivan oh from the uh, America's uh, royalty. We like to say the Neville family and uh, Touch My Soul. People can look for it where you where you look for uh, new music. I hope humbly that you had some fun and felt appreciated and stuff today, my brother. Thank you very much, man. Great talking to you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yes, indeed. A lot of fun going over your stuff. And if you, uh, no plans are coming here, huh? Do you have any? Not, not anytime, not that I know of right now, but I would love to. I would love to come over there. Yeah, I love, I love it there. All right, I've well, only been a couple, maybe three times. The Blue Note. And the funny thing, I, I was, I was getting some food. I was getting some sort of fish dish, and I had some little seafood joint in Hawaii. And I look who walks up is Hutch. Hutch uh, Hutchinson. Oh, yeah. randomly i'm like what are you doing <laughs> right you were yeah. on Maui, i think when that happened right uh, yeah yeah Ma mama's fish house i believe is the name of the place yeah <laughs> like, yeah all right my brother well high fives great seeing you great talking thank you dave thank you very much man you're welcome thanks for sharing the the neville magic with us one more time it's it's, it's thank a, you very much man it's humbling stay safe a pleasure man thanks Aloha. peace man peace to you hey,